So the question is, is a shift to nuclear energy worthwhile? Mark Cooper is an expert on this topic. He's also a senior fellow for the economic analysis at Vermont's Law School Institute for Energy and the Environment. And he says it's the wrong way. If we go the nuclear path, which is very expensive, we are going to put a strain on our economy, we're going to put a strain on consumers, and then people are going to get fed up with decarbonization much faster. If we develop the alternatives, which in most countries are local resources, this is the point. If you've got wind or solar or hydro or geothermal, it's a local resource. You're always better off developing your local resources, in, and they are less costly than nuclear. So as an economic proposition, nuclear power is the absolute wrong thing to do to deal with climate change. Because of cost or because of because the of environment? Cost. Simple cost. Now, I can give you other reasons, right? But I just start with the cost. And in America, the famous nuclear renaissance has disappeared. 90% of the reactors that were talked about are gone. The only four that are being built are behind schedule and over budget. It just is uneconomic. It cannot compete with, in America, wind is very cheap. Solar is getting cheaper. Uh, technology has raised the load factor on wind in America to 55%. Solar is being built with storage. It's now a 60% load factor. So all the myths about how I needed great big nukes to give me base load, that, that's so 20th century. It's an antiquated let, concept. Let, let, me, let me pick your brain as a consultant on this particular topic. There are countries around the world, specifically China, yes. who are planning to build quite a number of nuclear power plants. And let me, let me preface this by saying part of the reason is because they want to get rid of the less clean power plants, for example, coal, and put in these cleaner, newer nuclear power plants. Does it make sense for China to do, to do something like well, that? Well, an American nuclear executive, the CEO of the second largest uh, nuclear uh, utility in the U.S., basically said, he got in a little trouble for it, he said, look, here's what the Chinese do. They build their nuclear power, plant, power plants with twice as much labor that gets paid one-tenth the wage. The Chinese can get away with that at home. They can't export that model anyplace else. And so um, the Chinese can do what they want to do because they have still a command and control economy. When you look at the democratic advanced economies, Nuclear power is nowhere today. All right. One of the criticisms, and this goes back three years, if you look at Japan, and that's spread now to China and the U.S., people are talking about the environment. There is a, a potential environmental impact, and we saw it with Fukushima. There are people around the world who say, wait, I don't want that anywhere near where I live. Is that a problem, that, that the nuclear energy associations, and, and they've not overcome this in the decades that well, they've been in existence. But it's not simply a public relations problem, okay? It's a real problem, and here's the way I des describe it. You have a catastrophically dangerous power source that requires a remarkably complex technology to try and control it. And the problem is that, given the fickleness of Mother Nature and the frailties of human nature, with that complex of a process, you have problems. These are serious problems. They're real problems. And it's not the public health. Let's be clear. Tokyo Electric Power did not go instantaneously bankrupt because people died. Economic destruction, social despair, psychological uh, malaise. These are the impacts of a nuclear accident. So this is real. And it's not irrational. The technology really does defy the ability of human beings and Mother Nature to put it there and say, don't worry. OK, so if I'm China, if we're not going to do this nuclear power plant schedule, what are you recommending? Well, if you have solar, if you have wind, if you have hydro, and China has a great deal of potential. If you, if you develop yourself up to much higher levels of economic development, and we're all for that, you can do so at much lower levels of consumption. So if you look out at the, at the, the developed nations, Let's say I've just recently looked at nations with GDP per capita of above 30,000. There's a three-fold difference between the Irish and the Americans. The Irish consume one-third per dollar of GDP that the Americans do because they paid attention to energy consumption. So this notion that you have to 
burn and wasted a lot of electricity to develop is just wrong. You have to do it carefully. And of course, the French are way down there too, and they have a big nuclear fleet, so that's no guarantee that you're going to be efficient. The French, the French are high consuming. So the simple fact of the matter is you choose your development path carefully, you emphasize your domestic indigenous resources, and you can have both growth and low carbon. That was Mark Cooper, Senior Fellow for Economic Analysis at the Vermont Law School Institute for Energy and Environment.